I'm super OCD. So I just heard my AC kick on. I'm going to turn that off and then I'm going to have to remember <laughs> to turn it off when I get done. No wonder your show's name is Obsessed. <laughs> Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with Pinar Gavinch, managing partner of Sour Studio, which stands for Social Plus Urban. Sour is the recently rebranded name of the former Array Cabejo, an international award-winning architecture and design firm, which I may have just butchered the name. <laughs> we talked to lots of graphic designers and creative directors in the commercial and design and advertising world. So I'm excited to bring in another designer on the architectural side today. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Pinar Gavinch. Okay, kids, all the way from Brooklyn, I'm chatting with Pinar Gavinch. Pinar, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Josh, for having me. Well, hey, at the time of recording, it's like July 2020, the most interesting year <laughs> in humanity. <laughs> I feel like it's always good to kind of level set. Like, how are things in Brooklyn right now? Um, today, specifically, very rainy. Uh, in general, very interesting. I don't think I've ever seen New York like this before. I mean, New York is known to be a resilient city, but I've never seen the social life just disappear in like the face of maybe a week. Um, and it, that's been really interesting to observe and also really makes everyone rethink where they live, where they like the city, the house, where the office is, the commute. And I see a lot of New Yorkers questioning things. So it is a good thing. I think that's a silver lining. Um, but also, I mean, we're just very lucky and healthy in hindsight of everything. So but it's been great. interesting times. So is, is a lot of your team nearby? Like, are they all doing the remote thing at this point or what are, what are you guys, how's your setup right now? So we have a studio here in Brooklyn at Brooklyn Navy Yard, as well as in Istanbul. And we are seeing the different pace of COVID life and different reactions of different countries, which is really interesting. Uh, Islam went back to normal. Like everything is as if nothing has happened before, which I don't know what's that going to look like in a few months from now when this podcast is live. But, <laughs> right. uh, but now like everyone's back here. We really left it optional. Whoever is in like walking distance to the yard can come and work there because the yard is not necessarily a very dense environment anyway. So it made a good, um, you know, health crisis office space. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and some people are working from home. So it's really up to them. I'm definitely in the studio uh, majority of the times just because I have a two year old. Um, so yeah, that's <laughs> a good reason. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, I want to talk more about Sour and go into detail so we, we can circle back around to, to this part of the conversation. But before we get too far on that, I want to talk a little bit about your origin story, as I hear you have somewhat of a non-traditional path to the design world. So tell us how you got to be here. <laughs> I'll try to make it as brief as possible. It's very exhausting though. So I'm just going to try to wrap up in a few minutes. Um, so originally my background is in industrial engineering and um, I wanted to switch to business, but more so to understand the consumer side of things and behavioral side of things. And um, But I come from a family that are all academics. So everyone has a PhD. So it was like a non-discussed, but non-negotiative thing that I had right. to do at PhD. You get your doctorate. So, yeah, we know exactly. that. That's <laughs> We're just all waiting on it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so I did my undergrad in Turkey, and then I originally moved to New York to do a PhD in business at Columbia University. So I started that, and um, I did not like it. I did not like that I was just staying in the theoretical side of things. I wanted to apply things, see immediate results, prototype, see the next result. You know, I wanted to be more in action. Um, so I quit the uh, PhD program, did not know what to do. There was no plan B. 
like this one. <laughs> but um, for those of you just on audio, the T-shirt says <laughs> because there is no planet B. Also, exactly. Love that. Um, so, uh, but I did, because I grew up in Turkey, I felt like a foreigner to so many of the specialized languages such as in finance or sometimes also in architecture. But then I was like, okay, I'm going to be in business. I should understand finance more. So I did a master's in finance instead. And then I did a, a bit consulting. And then my first exposure into the design world was by co-founding a functional furniture studio uh, that was called NYFU. And it was really an FU to all the other <laughs> furniture brands. So I, we always had an <laughs> attitude, basically. Like, let's just lay that out there. Um, so I was more on the side of like setting up all the business side of things and setting up the e-commerce and setting up the supply chain logistics. Um, and it became really successful really fast. Uh, we opened our first showroom in Chelsea, Manhattan in a year, and then it was acquired in two and a half years. And then I joined Today Sour, then Eri Carbajo as a managing partner. And um, yeah, and that's been five years since. But I do wear multiple hats. I also serve on the board of Open Style Lab, which is a nonprofit organization uh, originated at MIT, but now is based in New York City uh, with the mission of making style accessible to people of all abilities. And I also am an adjunct faculty at Parsons School of Design in a strategic design and management program. So those are my like Batwoman, Wonder Woman, day job <laughs> type of roles. <laughs> I'm going to switch capes depending on which day it is. <laughs> exactly. So the sour rebrand, um, as of our conversation was like just yesterday, literally <laughs> that you guys launched it. So <laughs> listeners, you had to wait a few weeks before we got to talk about this, but what, tell me a little bit about kind of what went into that, like why, why rebrand the firm and how did that change kind of positioning or how you talk about yourselves or how you want to be perceived? I think it's just like, learning curve that we had to go through ourselves. So uh, partners who set up the company in Anjurai and Gonzalo Carbajo, they come, they both come from like big architecture firms. In Anjurai with Saha Hadid for about 10 years when it was only a small company too. And Gonzalo came from SOM, which is like highly corporate uh, mm, and yeah. one of the world's it biggest does. architecture firms. So I think like they did realize they wanted to do things a little bit their way, but I think that exploration takes some time and realizing really what we're most passionate about and what our attitude is like. I think that also sort of took some time. So we really didn't think about the name initially much when we were founding because, okay, there's our eye, there's Carbajo, let's just start this thing. And I think it took about like, First of three years, we were kind of like, okay, we're definitely doing more than just architecture and design. We have to rethink sort of how our business model, our research processes. So there was some like innovations we were plugging in in 2017, which I'll talk about more later. And, um, and after five years, we decided, okay, like, yes, our mission is to develop concepts that address social and urban problems through adaptive, inclusive, and sustainable design processes. And so while the name is a play with the words of social and urban, I think Sour really reflects our attitude. Uh, we do believe that there is a sufficient sugar coating in the world about everything that we're facing mm -hmm. today. Yeah. So it's just also an invitation to others to get real, confront things and be sour. So that's really where it came from. Mm. Do you feel like the, the rebrand was more of a reflection of where you guys already were, or is the rebrand more of like a, where you want to get to? Uh, I think both. Uh, definitely. We felt that we were so passionate about it and that our name did not reflect us enough. Like it's not about the people who started. It's the bigger than that. So we felt passionate enough about the current situation that we're in, that we felt the need of the rebranding. But I think, you know, it, it never ends. Learning never ends. Experimentation never ends. And uh, problems in the world also, unfortunately, never ends. So even though like today, the way we're, you know, uh, performing research is in a certain way and follow a design process in a certain way, I'm sure if we had this podcast five years from now again, um, maybe we're still called sour, but we would talk a lot about other different things. <laughs> right. 
Um, so tell me a little bit about like the size and shape. I understand you've got the office in Brooklyn and then another in, in Turkey, right? Yeah. And, uh, we do have projects here in us, in UK, um, a few different places in the middle East. So that sounds very big. So we could act like we're corporate, but we're really not. We're 13 people team combined studios. Oh, that's amazing. But we really believe in, I think our partners seeing how scaling up so fast can be detrimental to the design process as well as it becomes, I mean, in the end, we're all for-profit businesses. It is a business, but it becomes more about just the business at a large scale. We're very sensitive about trying to remain lean in order to be more innovative, but obviously we want to tackle so many things and we can't do it by ourselves. So we do collaborate with people often. We expand the team based on projects as needed. We don't you know, shy away from teaming up with even other architecture or design studios on the project. And we send out the invitation because we think the pie is big enough. You know, there is so many things yeah, right. to address. We don't necessarily have to grow our own, like, own core team, but um, we can definitely expand the team and adapt as we need. I hope, again, five years from now when we're talking, it's like a like hundred people studio. <laughs> and then right. you'll remind me. <laughs> Remember like, when I was 13. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I think we're just kind of like, uh, is the cap 25? But I'm sure many other like cool creative studios are talking about these things too. So it is a hard thing. It's hard to find that balance. We love the spot we're in now and hopefully we can remain that. I think I was talking, I, I think this was on the recording when I talked to Michael Janda, a couple episodes would will, will release right before yours um, about when I started my design agency. I had I had no target for how big I was going to be, which is kind of like a huge mistake in retrospect, but <laughs> ran that company for 16 years. But it was like, you know, I started out just by myself and I didn't have a goal of I'd be five yeah. or 10 or 50 people. So you're like, it makes it really tough to make decisions. And as you're sitting here, like is 25, the cap question mark, <laughs> you know, it's a similar kind of thing. Like what, yeah. what do we want out of this? Yeah, it's so hard. And I think it's a question you need to revisit annually, probably. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Ask yourself again. Ask yourself again. Exactly. Ask yourself again. Um, so what what are kind of the, I mean, I get kind of the philosophy or or maybe let's let's ask this as a question instead of me telling you what the idea is <laughs> tell us a little bit more about the philosophy behind sour in terms of the types of work so you told us a little bit about the mentality that we want to kind of strip away the sugar coating but what are the types of problems you're trying to solve and what are the types of projects that you guys pursue yep um so i think it takes a few forms like obviously as a young growing studio, a client approaches to you and it may not necessarily be a big scale project or it might be you know, something that is not even in line with your mission. So we try to take that. And I want to be really real about this because I feel like so many designers and architects that are starting out their business face the same problem. But barely anyone talks about these like real issues. So I really want to like highlight this part. So you sort of, I think you always, yes, have the option to say no, but you also need to survive, right? So how we take that is at least like, okay, is this type of work really helping us learn what we need to learn about XYZ for us to get there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So let's say if it's like a very technical project only and not creative, that is something we have to know so that we can realize our concepts that we create in the future, right? So we can't like shy away from that or not accept it just because we don't like it or we find it boring. We have to learn those. So we're okay with that. And we're also on the business side of things, we're like, it will pay the bills, right? So you have that category. Mm -hmm. You also have your, your, well, not often, but sometimes are very lucky to have clients that also share similar vision with you. I think finding those clients do take time and they come usually in very unconventional backgrounds. Like they're not necessarily developers only, but they might be a company that is just starting out with a new concept and, um, or a former, you know, innovator turned into a developer. So I, we find like those clients are the best. Um, and also we love working with startups just because they, we sh understand the passion very much so. And it is easier for us to 
you know, craft the concept and then fully reflect that and onboard the client to begin with. So there are those clients. So you're kind of like, okay, what is the ask for, for me here? Am I designing a retail studio? Am I designing a mixed use building? And what is the priority? So you can't address all problems at once or you can't, you know, tuck in all your solutions into one space. It has to make sense. Are we innovating something about the user journey here? Are we innovating something about the materials that we're using here? Is it about raising awareness about something? Is it more so just being regenerative instead of just being sustainable? So I think reframing the problem and really the brief is really, really important. Um, and we really try to pick the right battles for each project there. Uh, we, we've learned that, you know, for to be an innovative studio, you don't just have to create a crazy form. I think a lot of the association of uh, even young designers too is like, okay, for me to be a, like an innovative architect, I need to create this like crazy building. Mm -hmm. No, it can be in the most subtlest touches and it can be in really the user experience. And it can be about, you know, you're looking at accessibility in a new way, or you're looking at materiality in a new way, or just collaboration with the local network in a different way. So, um, those clients we love and we're very lucky to have them. We have a few projects right now that we're working on. Um, one is a mixed use development in Seattle where we are heavily incorporating urban farming and collaboration between local organizations mm -hmm. that do very farming. Cool. Uh, one is a, a recording studio out of an island in Turkey that is going to be a destination recording studio. So it's a hospitality slash music project uh, where we're trying to create a one of a kind experience in recording, but at the same time, we're very conscious about the hotel business itself utilizing the local network. And it can come from the simplest solutions, right? You can just work with local food vendors or local suppliers, but it speaks so much to sustainability. And it also is like design guidelines for a project. It's not even architectural at that point. You're just like presenting recommendations to a client. So there's also clients, client projects that are fun and in line with our mission, and then we can create some impact. And then there are self commissions that we do a lot. So um, we are very data inspired. And with that, we function a little bit more like a tech incubator, I want to say, where we um, identify a problem, reframe it, and decide how we're going to tackle that. Whether Sometimes we reach out to another company and work together with them on the research and ideation. Uh, sometimes we run with it. And then once we reach a concept, we actually pitch it to clients. So in that sense, we're very, I guess, entrepreneurial. Mm, and that's uh, interesting. we love that because I think it really, it's like doing a design competition all the time but really with a meaning to it, you know, the, the, there's a purpose attached to it and it comes with heavy research. And so it's really hard to ignore for businesses too. Like if you tell them, you know, these, this is the future of trends and this is where you are right now. You may be irrelevant in the future if you're not following those. Yeah, so I right. think going to them with that almost like an alert uh, is more attention grabbing than just saying, you know, we do nice designs. So there are three categories. <laughs> that was a very long <laughs> answer. <laughs> nice. I love it. And I love the the thing that you said about kind of like, it doesn't have to be some crazy form, like the design touches, you know, I'm, I'm a, a camera geek. Like I love video and photography. And, um, I was watching a guy's video the other day and he was talking about having owned this particular Leica camera for a year. And, what it was like having owned it. And, you know, when you look at this camera, it's, it's a really simple design, but what he was so excited about were all the little details, all like the touch of the feel, the finish, um, and the way the buttons looked. And it wasn't about that. It was some wild form factor that didn't look like a camera. It was that the little things were right. Isn't it always about the details? And in the end, the feeling you get out of it too. I mean, we're, we have a very human-centric approach and you kind of have to, you know? It's like, I, I don't even understand how this is a discussion. You know, if we were on a planet <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> where there is no humans and you're designing a building just for the planet, maybe your attention would might be in a different direction. But in the end, 
we're designing for somebody else's experience. And this could be a retail store, this can be a product, this can be a building, this can be a park. And it has to start with that perspective and you really need to understand the user behavior, do your ethnographic studies, talk to people, perform diary studies, whatever you're doing, but understand their main pain points or expectations out of things if you really want to create a change. I think as designers, um, and there are some discussions around, you know, people who are not educated or come from background in architecture and design can't necessarily make the calls, but it's really not about that. It's about finding your starting point and what the real problem is, not the problem that is discussed. And really go from there, adding in your own personal know-how and expertise, and then develop it from there. Maybe sometimes it does end up with a funky form, but maybe it really does it. It's so subtle that unless if it's an educated eye or people who is there off, like people who are there often, um, you won't even notice. So, yeah, we really believe in that. And I think I actually, um, with our new branding, Sour, it does sometimes feel very like techy and innovative, like the brand itself, like the logo. I mean, we work with this amazing graphic designer. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, take you out of your comfort zone. And we're like, great, because we can't do it ourselves. So please be our guest. (laughs) And it does feel very like futuristic. And then I love the juxtaposition that it can be next to a project of ours that looks very calm and serene and actually good for your mental health. You know, it doesn't have to feel like a rocket or like a sci-fi movie. Do we want to give a shout out to this amazing graphic designer? Yes. Uh, his firm's name is Antrepo. He is based in Istanbul, but has done work internationally everywhere. Uh, the, uh, the lead designer's name is Mehmet Gözetnik. Um, so I'll save the pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, so we yeah. will uh, get all of that from you and put that in the show notes because I'm not even sure I could repeat that back to you on the first try. <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> took me lots of practice to get Bernard right. So. <laughs> Well, we'll, I appreciate we'll it. I do, get, yeah. I do get Bernard sometimes. So I really appreciate the ask. Bernard. <laughs> I wow. mean, do I even look like a Bernard? At least ask for the sake of like, you know. I think you need a better mustache to be a Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have a t-shirt saying I'm not Bernard. <laughs> Bernard's not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were talking a little bit about um kind of the, the importance of programming for the people, for the users, how the building's going to be used. And again, like not to beat a dead horse here, but like things have changed so much thinking about work from home, how dense should office space be anymore? Um, should, should a building handle more in terms of like living, breathing plants, you know, daylight, all, all of these kind of issues. And I'm sure you guys are thinking about this stuff, but how is, how has that impacted your work even in the last few months? I think, um, you know, we interviewed, uh, she, I believe served as the head of a world research at Savills for many, many years. And now she's the chair of UCL Real Estate Bartlett Institute and Yolanda Barnes. So she was saying basically anything we built in 20th century was wrong. <laughs> so I think so like first- So that going for us. <laughs> <laughs> Let's first accept that, that this is not working, right? I think this was already there, like experts were shouting about it, but we really had to see it firsthand and COVID so, sort of like expedited that for everyone. And, you know, our, like there was a term uh, like commonly used as architectural psychology back in the 1970s. It's not a new thing. And now sort of like environmental psychology is coming back to play uh, as if it's like something new to consider. And then there's like wellness certificates. Like it was, this was already there. We knew natural light is good for us. We knew we have to have access to green. And, you know, we also, an um, uh, environmental psychologist that we love to work with, uh, Birgitta Gatterslaven, again, saving <laughs> the pronunciation there. Um, we'll put that she, one in the show notes too. <laughs> <laughs> She um, she says, you know, the idea of a home and an enclosed space only works when you can exit it. So I think, you know, once we were in a lockdown, not only people in design, like everybody started to question where they're living and why they're living there to begin with. I think we're so busy in our day to day, we don't even think about those things often. Yet We're lucky to be in an architectural and science studio that this is something we think about. But in the end, it does require 
the collaboration of not only the developers and other, you know, cl potential clients, but also the end user. Because if there is demand, then the people who are responsible of building these, even the government, the cities, like they will react, right? Like it's really hard as a designer, as often, especially as architects, you don't have control of your own medium. I mean, you can be very passionate about a topic, you can pitch it to someone and then maybe they adopt it, but they might cost the engineer it along the way. The engineers might say about it along the way. There might be an economic crisis. Like we lived this many, many times. We've seen how things so unrelated to us affected our projects in the past. And, you know, it's so hard for just architects to push that. And I think, you know, we can do more than just creating the concepts. We can openly talk about it. We can contribute to the education. We can make our language more accessible and not speak very high level at, so that we're not understandable and therefore we remain irrelevant in the conversation. If we change some of those things about us, I think we would have a bigger say in how we can change things. Because I think the silver lining about COVID is that it showed us that this is not working. And as, you know, people who are not even buying houses, but renting places or going to offices, they're going to have more to say now that this is in our living memory. Maybe they do want an apartment with a balcony, even if they're renting it. Maybe they're going to opt out from going to the office because the office experience is very inhumane, especially, I mean, you see all the recommendations that are coming out today in terms of like, you know, health protection, but they're really not sustainable because the implications of it psychologically or even, you know, in like um, just like the current experience is, it's not going to work and it can't last. And people may just say like, why would I go to the office then? So. Yeah. And I we think, have this whole issue of people been doing this remote thing for the last few months. And I mean, generally it works. I mean, we, yeah. there, there are things that are not ideal, but we've proven out more so than ever remote work as possible. Yeah. I think, you know, the, mindset of the corporates had to change to begin with rather than the people because there are so many you know you might be a person with a disability you might be a mom that needs to work from home and they are not less than any other person just because they're also those other things and those people like suffer it throughout so i think in terms of accessibility and inclusion and just giving more flexibility to people and accepting them with their personal lives that sort of had to happen for the corporates and immediately. So seeing that shift and at least giving the option to people and the flexibility now, it's not going to be like an option anymore. Like they're going to have to do it. So seeing that is great. But we also do believe, you know, innovation happens through interaction and, you know, we're social beings in the end. That is not going to change. Uh, unless we like adapt our DNA somehow, <laughs> but we, we will right. remain as social beings and we do need to interact with people. And it's important for our just like not only daily pleasure, but mental health. So, you know, there are even like studies into, you know, especially in elderly, if they live in isolation and they don't have social interactions on a day to day, they're more likely to have cognitive disabilities. So, we can't just strip that out from our lives. We just need to find a new approach that is maybe a little bit more decentralized, may, maybe a little bit more micro-urban uh, instead of, you know, clustering everyone into just like one hey, dense help me area. With that. What is, what is micro-urban? So we talked uh, about this, like we, we have been talking about this recently too. Like you, this is like New York is a great example, right? Everything is in Manhattan. I mean, even like Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, like they, it all developed later. And there's a huge commute going into Manhattan, hence the high rises. And now Manhattan feels like a desert. And, you know, I don't know if the, you know, the, I mean, there might be a vaccine, things might go back to normal, but this will be in our living memory and we will be conscious of density and we will be mm. conscious of not having access to nature but we will still want to see people right and there is already like a lot of sustainability issues around commuting too or uh, as we were talking about how enclosed spaces doesn't work well for mental health 
cars are also an extension of enclosed space. So uh, again, uh, uh, Birgitta was mentioning a study that they've done where they saw people who take public transportation are actually in better mental health than people who drive to places. So I think there's a lot to that. And the way I think we can rethink the cities is by decentralizing all the density and creating these micro urban areas that almost feels like you're working from a coffee shop, but it's your office, Mm, right? So you don't miss out on the social interaction aspect of things. Uh, You still go to an office like you, we, I mean, yes, working from home works, but all of us want to get out of the house, right? So it really doesn't work um, on its own. It can't, but having that flexibility works really well. So I think leaving it more to the people to decide and having the option to be able to go, but for it to be more sustainable and be more responsive to a public crisis like this, we have to really rethink how we sort of built these like dense environments. And it's, really, really hard. Like it's going to require public private partnerships. It's like, how are we going to even rethink the density of these high rises? Like, are we going to change the upper floors? Like, are they going to be knocked down? It's going to be, you know, there's a lot, lot to think about. So yeah, these are not small questions. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, maybe we can shift the topic a little bit. Tell us about one of your proudest moments as a designer. Um, I think, uh, it was in 2017 where, you know, we were already a studio at that point that does heavy research and, uh, we do like a team synthesis session. We ideate with different, uh, people from different backgrounds, uh, or demographic. And we were already doing that, but we were kind of like, you know, there's something missing about this. And also realizing a lot, we touched a little bit upon that too. There's really no solution to any problem without educating the end user, right? Like unless you collaborate with the people who are going to either buy or be in your product in the end, they're like, we can discuss or like research or propose concepts all the way, but it really doesn't work. And so we decided to open our research process, at least partially to public. And especially where we had collaborative uh, ideation sessions, we wanted to form those as panel discussions. And we called it What's Wrong With? Because that's typically a starting point question we ask. And it's also a little <laughs> right. provocative. You know, when you say future cities, it's nice, it's catchy. But like when you say what's wrong with cities, it's kind of disturbing and makes people uncomfortable. And we embraced that. And we wanted um, to invite like progress makers who are not necessarily always like big corporate companies. And usually they're not the progress makers anyway, the lean uh, and startups are. So invite them to the conversation and post it at locations where the awareness would matter the most. So we teamed up with colleges and schools to host a panel discussion there. We did it at Pratt Institute, at Parsons. We were going to do What's Wrong With Travel at NYU, which then COVID happened. Then we were kind of like, if we ask this question now, do you right. think it's an obvious answer? And you know, Is there's there so many that's things. that's not wrong with travel right now? <laughs> yeah, and they would totally like distract the conversation to just one angle where there are so many other things we need to discuss about travel too, right? And like, it could be access, it can be sustainability, it could be. Um, you know, experience. So I think we were going to miss out on that. So that is definitely postponed. But so the panel discussions for our own selfish agenda works as an ideation session, uh, at least it's a piece of it, our research. And for the public, it's a collaborative discussion where we do um, ask the question, try to reframe the problem, and then ideate together, uh, engaging the audience. And so I think, you know, doing that move That is also pretty unconventional, I feel like, in the architecture world where typically, you know, uh, we remain in our bubbles or in our ivory towers or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that was really our proudest moment. And um, it really sparked so many things since even then, too. I, I just like... I'm almost like frustrated. Why didn't we do it before? We've collaborated with different people because of it. We've seen other people in the audience collaborating 
just because it sparked an idea. Um, we looked into some of the problems in a way different angle. I've learned so much and I consider myself as an educated person and I read a lot and I would leave every panel discussion as a, wow, I never thought about that before or wow, I didn't understand the significance of that before. So um, it's just doing it collectively and in a more inclusive way just brings so many good conversations and inspires ideation. It's so, so important. And before all this like podcast and IGTV madness happened before COVID, I guess in 2019, we decided, well, we're doing also so many expert interviews parallel to this, but we don't get to future those and we don't want to leave the conversation just with like one panel discussion. So we also created What's Wrong With the podcast, uh, where we feature some of our expert interviews as podcast episodes too. And apparently it was the right move. <laughs> now everyone's trying to, I mean, you're like, you know, you've been doing this forever, but I think now I can't even like follow my stories because everyone's on some like IGTV. Um, but yeah, I think the more you make your research accessible, the more you invite the uh, you know, diverse people into your conversation, the more innovative ideas you're going to get. And we have to get rid of the notion that, you know, it's our design, we're going to do it, or it's like our name, you know, it, it just has to be like this. I don't think we have really another way. Um, and that's why I think that move is, even though it's not necessarily a design move, but that is our proudest moment. That's really cool. Um, Maybe this is along similar lines, but do you have any um, any design heroes, like any other firms that you greatly respect, or other other architects, oh, or even so many non architecture <laughs> designers? Anybody that you're a big fan of? Um, so many people that I'm a big fan of in design world, and you know, even like in architecture, fashion design, um, graphic design. But I think when you say heroes that really makes me think more like unorthodox answers, you know? So I guess I'll focus on those. Like, I think, you know, when you said hero, like for one of the first people that came into my mind was actually Nina Simone. Um, because, you know, she famously said that artist's duty is to reflect the times. And that to me is a definition of an artist. I mean, we resonate with that so much. And um, we really don't believe in, design for design's sake and also creative people really have a superpower to sort of visualize or show something in a way different way if you were just like talking about it and that is something that you can you should use for purpose and so she inspires us a lot and i think you know I mean, any architecture or design studio would when they're like submission mode or like deadline mode you listen to some like real good music so like <laughs> i think right. i feel like her like voice like in the back end whenever i'm like trying to be like inspirational um so that's definitely one i can think of i guess another like unconventional answer would be john lassiter like formerly disney formerly pixar and now disney again um because i think storytelling is like the one of the biggest virtues you can have. And if you're a good storyteller, like you can have the best design for something, but if you can't really tell the story or have people adopt it or, you know, I reflect with it and really embrace it. It's, it's a lacking design or lacking creative moments. So I think it's such an art. And I mean, Pixar, like creativity Inc is like my, one of my favorite business, but non-business books. Like, it's just, I admire their storytelling so much. I see them as heroes. Like that would actually maybe be like a dream project to collaborate with them on like a spatial experience, like collaborate with Pixar or something. You um, may not be the first guest who has said that they would love really? to collaborate with Pixar, but, but listeners, we will add this to the list. So if you know anyone, <laughs> hook us up. Oh my God. Dreamless, like putting it out there, however far-fetched that is. But yeah, I think some definitely creative people, but not from the architecture or design world, but there are many, you know, architects or designers that we really admire. Like Snowetta is one of the firms that we really admire. Mass Design Group out of Boston, we really admire. Um, Vishan Chakrabarty, who actually we recently interviewed, we really admire his firm pal. So yeah, many, many people to admire and learn from and respect. Um, 
And, you know, but when you say heroes, it's like, I feel like it's a different level. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we can't get out of this interview without asking you this question. And your answer can be anything that's work or client, or it doesn't even have to be design related. But I'm curious what you find you are most obsessed with right now. That's the OCD question. We're obsessed with so many things. Oh my God. Um, well, I think, you know, just because the time that we are in, um, I mean, we have, you know, because our mission heavily relies on a lot of things around social and urban issues. Uh, but I think like COVID sort of helped us prioritize some of the things that we wanted to maybe research on or address or self-commission, like we talked about. And I think like at least one silver lining of this entire mess of a health crisis is it really gave us the opportunity to pause and reflect and rethink some things that we knew or felt that weren't working, but now we can actually do something about it because people would react to it or they would want to do it or there might be funding for it, whatever that is. Um, so I think, you know, the few things we're obsessed with, I guess, like relating to the Times too. Uh, I mentioned earlier, um, we are rethinking the work from home experience for uh, parents, especially working moms, and we're collaborating with Hey Mama for that, which is a especially nationwide moms of two year olds. <laughs> moms of two year olds. This is all for myself. You have to understand. It's self therapy. <laughs> Um, and we're collaborating with Hey Mama, uh, that is a nationwide working moms, uh, I guess, community, uh, membership organization, uh, as well as on the research side, we're collaborating with Openbox, which is another really cool, uh, design strategy studio in, based in Flatiron, Manhattan. Um, so because what really bothered us and we didn't intend to, I mean, obviously like personally, this is really interesting for me, but we didn't intend to sort of like focus on that angle. We were, we're also actually collaborating with NC State and um, Fabricant out of London on rethinking sort of some of the designs around us, whether those are immediate surroundings or built environment uh, to make them more responsive or adaptive to a health crisis. So that is like already one angle. Um, but I think the reason why we sort of really prioritize the work from home experience was the publications that were coming out or the Instagram stories you see or the TikToks you see it was just so it's crazy. Like in the end, you know, we're in the business of, you know, future making and we want to inspire the future and children are the future, right? So a lot of the things start with like when we're young and yet like, and you know, obviously it comes from the best place and really reacting to the circumstance immediately. Like people had to adapt to work from home. They adapted however it worked. So it was really non-collaborative with the children and, and non-communicative. And we saw like a lot of articles, even in like big publications on how like, you know, how to control your child when you're working or like things like that, which is like, what is going to be the mental and like psychological implications right. of something like this for children today for the future? Like this could not be healthy. Um, so when I say we think work from home, I'm meaning more the how can we, design things, interventions, or hacks that can sort of help the communication and collaboration as a family, rather than I go into my office, I close the door, and, you know, the child is crying outside, I can't deal with it right now. You know, you're doing that because you have to, but it shouldn't be the only way that we're trying to make this work. The so, current hack is close the door, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, that worked pretty it's, well. <laughs> it's very top down, very like, you know, because you just, it's like putting out fires. People had to do that. Like imagine, you know, single moms, imagine like uh, families with multiple children of different ages and the communication needs of all ages are different. And obviously like you can't even, and we've, we've been interviewing a lot of children's psychologists because we want to understand uh, their perspective well. And like, they were even saying, you know, you can't even the brain development, the front end of it really continues until the age of four. So trying to negotiate with them before that is not even like really possible right. biologically <laughs> so but how but after the age of four you can actually create a collaborative model 
to really address the situation and act as a family and with them rather than just like, I have a call, don't bother me for the next two hours. Um, so yeah, so I think like that was sort of like, wow, this is really harsh what we're reading out there. Like this cannot be good for the future. So let's kind of prioritize this. So that's one obsession. So that's why I'm also like very observant of any comments that any parents make right now. Um, and I'm just like taking notes nonstop or looking at my behavior. Uh, we did a diary study uh, collaborating with Open Openbox with uh, seven moms. And I guess this is a very teaser information, but from a few months from now, this might already be out there. Um, like apparently the gesture, like this is something that we do a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I do rec recognize that, but didn't realize how offensive that is for children because th when they did, when we interviewed the children and got their perspective, they were really bothered by that move. And maybe you just like do it in and the for moment. For those of us just it's listening, it was the, the pointer <laughs> finger, not the not the other one. It was the <laughs> thank the you. Ordinarily yeah. less offensive finger. But you know, I thank use that when I'm like just a minute, you know, I'll hold up that or like that's listen not how they or, understand yeah, it apparently. Right? So, so it's so what's, interesting. What's the take on that? Um, I mean, their side they just find it rude. Right. It's simply mm. as like disrespect. They don't understand because I think it generally gestures come into play when we are feel the most strongest about it. So if we're stressed, we're maybe doing a harsh move, right? Rather than just, oh, one minute, like it's not a light move at that moment. So it feels very dictatorial, I believe, to them. And they find it rude and maybe they act out because of it. And then in the back of your head, you don't understand why they're acting out, you know. But there's a lot of things that build to that moment where they're bothering you or not allowing you to do the call or acting out. So we're trying to understand the buildup. And this was apparently a hard no from, from children's side, but it was really interesting to find out. It's interesting too. I've got a brother-in-law, uh, actually two brother-in-laws who are Marines, but one in particular that taught me this thing that he calls the insignificant point which is like you kind of bring huh. all your other fingertips out next to the pointer finger. So you just have like one little digit yeah. of your finger is sticking out. And he said in particular, when you're like doing crowd control, non-English speakers, you're trying to not be threatening. You're just trying to encourage and you're trying to point something out without that offensive large finger. So he taught me this, this insignificant point. So I, thought, I love you know, that. That, that we'll psychology probably use works that. the same, you know, it doesn't, it probably translates across language and everything else. So maybe yeah. for kids when you're like, just a minute, <laughs> just one. Exactly. Because maybe it also comes from, you know, even though like they do it as a language barrier, technically children are still learning the language. So there's probably a similar type of barriers there too. So this is very offensive. Like if my spouse did that to me all the time, I would be very annoyed. Right. So you just need to start yeah, to right. think at that angle. You're like, is that disrespectful? <laughs> is that the right move? Um, but it's I like love even that more so if you wag it, it, right? If you're oh, and yeah. that the wagging follows the pointing, right? right. Always. <laughs> 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 yeah. So we're, I'm obsessed with these minor, and I'll point it out like this. Uh, so I'm obsessed with these minor details like this, which apparently are minor, aren't minor? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I think we probably have a whole show just about. The point your finger. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like we could probably do a whole nother episode, but um, maybe I'll jump out to this question, which is um, I'm curious if you have a favorite piece of advice that you have received or maybe a favorite piece of advice to pass along to fellow designers or to clients or anything like that. Um, to your old. I think my favorite advice that I ever got was a very simple, but a very, very effective one um, was from Sophia Benz, who was one of the first five people to work at Spotify and then became one of the most influential female angel investors of the Nordics. Um, now I think she's partners mm. of like a seed venture fund in Sweden or maybe based out in Berlin. You can fact check that, but yeah. Um, so she used to like mentor me every now and then because I had such like an entrepreneurial uh, life. And when I was maybe like 22 years old, so it was, uh, I find with disclosing my age, like eight, 10 years before us now, like I can't even remember what it was, but she said, 
um, the best thing you can do is just talk to as many people as possible and just listen to them because they may not know about you. They may not know about what you're going to do as your business, but they might spark an amazing idea for you. Um, and I think, I mean, I took that to heart and I really, I mean, it works well for me too, because I'm a social person. I don't mind talking and listening to people, but it's really, I think also a good advice now looking back, especially the time that we're in, like there's a lot of conversation about being more inclusive in our conversations and bringing on different perspectives, different backgrounds. Um, but I think if anything has uh, been good to me in my life in terms of business or any other, you know, a career moves, it was because I took that to heart and I just listened to everyone. Um, so that is definitely something, uh, that stuck with me and I would, uh, you know, pass that on. And I guess to add to that as an advice, I would really encourage, um, people. And I feel like maybe it's the educational system. Like, I feel like I, started to do this later in my life or, you know, at least definitely after my teenage life, but, um, reframing the problems you see around us. Um, I think that's very, very important because things usually are not what it seems. Um, and really understand the underlying conditions that sort of, uh, result in those problems. I think that's really important. So just trying to look at things in different perspectives. And that is also why working with diverse teams is very important because they help you get that background, uh, in place and really help you look at things in a different lens. Um, so yeah, just talk to a lot of people, expose yourself to everyone possible and reframe the problems you see around you. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, maybe before we let you go, do you have any um, like asks or encouragements or requests of our our listeners? Anything you want to charge them with? Um, I mean, I'll echo the advice part. I think you know we're also in a good time to do that. Like uh, the pace of life slowed down a bit, <laughs> you know, because of everything going on, and so it's a good time to really rethink some things and just uh, reach out to a person that maybe you never worked with before and try to collaborate with them. I feel like our, you know, most innovative ideas came out from teams that we had that were, you know, both able-bodied or like disabled people. And uh, I say it in the best uh, intentions because I feel like people with disabilities are the best hackers and innovators because they don't have any other way to deal with it. So yeah, right. do that, you know, if you haven't worked with uh, someone who is either black or middle Eastern, do that, like try to get their perspective. And I think, especially if you aspire to do international projects or, um, be an international firm, it is so, so important that you, listen to different backgrounds and different experiences. Um, so I think everything going on in the world is already telling us to do this, but it's a good moment to really practice it rather than just like think, thinking of doing it. So I was just really encourage them to act on it and, you know, don't even be like shy from like failing or in, you know, almost offending some people because you need to start somewhere if you never did it before. Um, just, you know, be honest about it, be uh, vulnerable about things and just, just do it. I think that's the only thing I will say. Love it. Well, Hey, before we let you go, um, tell our listeners where they can find you and sour on the interwebs. <laughs> um, well, they can follow us on Instagram. Uh, our handle is what is sour. I think our Instagram will help answer that for you. Nice. Um, our website is sour.studio and they can also follow the panel discussions that are coming up and our podcast of what's wrong with. Uh, on what's wrong with dot xyz on instagram as well so they can follow us on all very cool well there was nothing wrong with this interview thanks so much <laughs> for joining us today thank you so much for having me this was such a treat and thank you for being obsessed with design thanks very for good. making us obsessed <laughs> <laughs>
I am officially an obsessed alumni. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Okay, kids, that's episode number 148 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Stop.